Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the uh, training session for the Australian Marine Debris Initiative Database Protocols to Monitor and Collect Litter and Marine Debris along different litter pathways. Welcome to this session. Um, as part of the work uh, with ReefClean, um, these motoring, mo monitoring protocols rather have been uh, developed uh, recently and this is the launch of them. And they've been developed to offer a standardized approach for citizen scientists collecting this important data on a national scale. Robust monitoring programs led by citizen scientists are vital to guiding marine debris reduction and prevention strategies and to protect the future of our marine resources. Um, this is uh, the first part of a two-part uh, session this afternoon um, and I'd firstly just like to introduce myself. My name is Mark Fletcher. I'm based at uh, Agnes Water up at Queensland um, and I'm in the MD uh, database support role. Um, also on this call is my colleague Jodie Jones. Um, she is an expert in the field and uh, is available to um, answer any questions um, and will chime in when she feels the need. So thank you Jodie. Um, one thing I do need to ask just in terms of housekeeping is that if you're able to pop through your questions in the chat as we go, um, then that means that at the end we can actually have you um, speaking to those questions and, and we can make sure that we answer those for you. Uh, I will endeavour to look at the chat as we go, uh, but also Jodie will be assisting me there. So uh, part one, the first session that we're going to look at between now and quarter past four are the, is an overview of the ANDI protocols and the importance of them. Uh, and then we'll have a 15 minute break and at 4.30, if you'd like to stay with us um, for part two, we'll be then talking about how those different monitoring protocols are applied to different types of location settings and that will go for about one hour. Just checking the, hi checking the chat, hello to everyone who said hello. Welcome. Okay, let's press on. Uh, what I would like to do firstly is that on behalf of Tangaroa Blue, we would like to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the land and sea country on which we live and work and pay our respect to elders past, present and emerging. In terms of the uh, protocols, um, I would like to uh, acknowledge that it was a collaborative effort um, with scientific input from quite a number of uh, academic uh, institutions. And a special thank you to the Moston Family Foundation and the Australian Citizen Science Association um, for their um, uh, energies and efforts in allowing us to develop the protocol document. And last but not least, uh, a, thank, a special thank you to the Australian Government uh, Reef Trust, uh, launched in early 2019. The Reef Clean project aims to remove and prevent marine debris along the Great Barrier Reef region through till 2023. Okay, uh, the agenda this afternoon, um, 10 things we'd like to cover off with you, um, very briefly about the organisation, and then talking about the AMD database. We'll move through monitoring at a high level and then some of the reasons why you may want to monitor a site. Um, importantly, we'll talk about site types and litter pathways. And, and this is the point where you can really start thinking about uh, some of the um, sites that you may have something to do with and potentially what your opportunities are to begin monitoring those. Importantly, we'll talk about intervention points along the litter pathways and some of the specifics of uh, monitoring uh, each site. Site selection and planning is also uh, very important. Uh, and then we'll talk briefly about the difference between cleanups and monitoring. Some of you may have had experience with cleanups before, so it's a good point to sort of just describe briefly what those differences are between the two of them. And finally, we'll just wrap that up with a, a theory of change where we can hopefully encapsulate everything we've talked about, and that will set us up to move into part two. Let me briefly check the chat, make sure there's nothing coming through. Fantastic, okay. Tangaroa Blue Foundation. So our mission is to inspire and catalyze action and empower others to remove and prevent waste from entering the marine environment. So really what we're focused on is, is on the removal and the prevention of waste. And that prevention uh, aspect is absolutely key. So uh, in mythology, in Maori and Polynesian mythology, uh, Tangaroa is the God of the ocean. And there's this wonderful concept that if you look after me, then I will look after you. 
um, and that's something that we absolutely believe in. Um, the origin, the organisation started as a not-for-profit back in uh, Western Australia in 2004. Uh, a key point here is um, relates directly to what we're talking about this afternoon and this notion that we want to be doing more than clean up and monitoring actually provides um, an amazing set of um, robust and consistent data and that evidence um, allows us to create change above and beyond what a, just a simple cleanup could do. Briefly, I want to talk about the AMDI database. So um, the Australian Marine Debris Initiative uh, has a database um, that is really focused on allowing citizen scientists to capture um, data about not just marine debris, but also terrestrial litters. So that's an important distinction to make here because we will be talking about site types that are beyond the marine environment. Um, point of note is that the database really does provide a wonderful sort of standardized system for um, recording and classifying um, debris data. Um, it's a place to contribute data, a place to store the data. You can also access the data from there. And uh, crucially, it's, it's a way to uh, provide that evidence base to allow the, um, the uh, creation of source reduction plans. Um, I should note at this point that this, this session and the next session are not covering um, entry of uh, monitoring um, data into the database itself. That's a separate training, which we are absolutely more than happy to provide. One thing you may be curious about uh, around the difference between debris and litter, um, before I forget, is that uh, rubbish pollution and waste or debris are litter on land and just referred to as marine debris in the marine environment. I will use those terms interchangeably, but hopefully now understand the, the context for their use. Monitoring. So th this is perhaps the most important slide of the first session, and it's really about uh, the consistent application of surveys um, undertaken at regular intervals. Um, it's about standardized methods that are adapted to the type of site. And this is what the document covers. And the idea here is that monitoring programs provide a much more detailed understanding of debris and litter types than what a general cleanup might do. So types of litter and debris flows from source to sink and also trends increasing or decreasing within an area. So as mentioned, monitoring is really that uh, crucial step in, in generating that evidence base to enable the development of source reduction plans and interventions. And this all goes to the point of what we think is extremely important here, that it's really to help prevent the release of litter at the source. And as you'd expect, also critical to measuring whether those interventions and programs have been successful or not. I should say at this point, one of the things you're going to be seeing is a lot of talk of transects. And transects is one of the key um, methodology um, aspects that allow us to actually undertake this monitoring. So um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but transects are a, a key, uh, key aspect, which I'll go into a little bit more detail shortly. Why monitor a site? So as we look at this slide, perhaps you might just want to have a bit of a think around uh, some of your own motivations for monitoring sites that you're aware of. One of the key things here is around the belief that there are potential issue, issues with litter. So you might be of the sense that there are patterns or cycles of litter buildup, and you'd like to know more about those in detail. You might like to expand your understanding uh, and knowledge of litter types and quantities. And as I said, this might be with a view to create some sort of change via strategic interventions. You may also be aware of sites um, that actually have cultural um, significance, environmental or other economic values, where you think that Monitoring could really play a role in, in preemptively or proactively uh, in maintaining the values of those sites. Um, and there's a couple of bullet points there um, talking about cultural values and also to protect economic values or potentially even tourism values um, of an area. Um, and as we talked about earlier, there's also this notion that, that you want to be able to understand that uh, a litter intervention, for example, a single use plastic ban, may have actually uh, resulted in some measurable change on the ground. So these are some of the beliefs uh, and desires that may mo uh, motivate you to want to monitor a site. This is a useful slide to perhaps understand an example litter pathway where we can see that it's potentially the case where we have litter move from being on the ground through potentially built drainage systems to inland waterways, eventually to estuaries and potentially to coastal shorelines. This is not a hard and fast litter flow. It's just an example flow 
of, um, of how litter may move through the environment. Um, also, we have the underwater um, side of things and, and there's a potential for, um, for litter to, to aggregate there. Um, I'm sure you can think of sites that uh, are within your local area or that you've had something to do with, and you may have seen some debris or litter there that, that you can identify um, has potentially come from somewhere else. And tracking one of these, tracking the flow of litter through these, these sites uh, is, is, is such a crucial and important um, aspect of, of monitoring and, and may be suitable for your situation. It's useful to know that when you're looking at the potential flow of litter um, through these different site types, that really when you're looking at your ability to prevent and, and mitigate um, and remove debris, it's much easier the further up the chain you are. And that as you move closer and closer towards the coast, then your ability to sort of prevent and mitigate really does drop off. And likewise, when you're looking at the chance of the litter reaching the, reaching the ocean, when you're much higher up in that chain towards the built drainage and on the ground side of things, that really you've got um, the, the chance of that litter reaching the ocean is, is much lower. And as you head towards uh, that marine environment, that chance really does increase um, over time. So a little bit of a summary slide here with site monitoring. Um, Firstly, there's this notion of a source and a sink. So when you're thinking about sites that are of interest to you, having, a, having some understanding or a hypothesis around where litter is released and where it may end up um, it may guide you on where monitoring might be appropriate. Again, it's potential to track back litter to the source uh, and it does provide data to help turn off that tap, um, as you can see in that image to the right there. So four goals here, it's identifying types of litter, identifying source and sink pathways, or pathways between source and sink, and also intervention points. And this is what you're gonna be mindful of when you're considering doing monitoring. And of course, to measure the success of interventions. Site selection and planning is very important. Uh, it's going to be based on your drivers and motivations. Um, for example, the protection of cultural values. Um, there's going to need to be some clarity on the desired outcomes that you have of monitoring. So you may wish to target a known litter load as opposed to uh, all other litter types. Uh, access considerations are really important uh, if you're on coastal or estuarine systems, tidal, tidal range, um, vehicular access, flood levels. Uh, there may be cultural uh, aspects there as well in terms of times when you um, should not be accessing those sites. There may be social factors as well, uh, festivals, community events, um, and those may impact your monitoring. Um, you may need to get permissions as well from, for example, traditional owners. Uh, and if we think about some of the recent flooding that we've seen along the East Coast, then um, you know, the ability to monitor a site at required, at those regular required intervals may be impacted by, by um, flooding potential. Safety, obviously extremely important here, uh, where we're looking at wildlife and environmental factors. Um, and uh, having, a, having a very clear understanding of what those may be so that you can have um, risk management plans in place. Timing, this is probably, uh, this, is, this is the most crucial aspect of, of monitoring um, in terms of having a schedule for when you need to be doing it. Now, quarterly monitoring is the minimum frequency um, that, that we recommend um, and that the document talks about. More frequent is better, but it really does depend on the volume um, of litter that you expect through. So for example, um, one of the things we'll be talking about in the second session is around monitoring built drainage. Um, and in that, those circumstances, what we'd be looking at is a monitoring of around about every eight weeks. So uh, there is a timing consideration that, that you, know, you want to be considering quite high in your list. Organizational capabilities, do you have the availability to do this uh, in your workforce and capacity to do this? Um, so that's something to bear, bear in mind. Uh, and also the site must fit between monitoring area guidelines, which we'll talk about in the next session. Uh, and overall, the site needs to sit inside of the protocols um, that are put forward in that document. Cleanups and monitoring, we've touched on this a little bit, but really it's around cleanups as being a way to understand large debris issues, um, focusing on the immediate environment, but really the consistent data from monitoring is, is where it's at to start really putting in place interventions and source reduction plans. Uh, there's a rigor, rigor and consistency in that, for example, GPS anchor, anchored transects. 
uh, it produces high quality data sets which, are, which give that evidence base that you need to um, address the litter uh, as it's being generated at the source. Uh, and we've got a whole host of other aspects here that really allow you to be confident um, in monitoring the before and after. Final slide here. Um, you would have already got a strong sense of this is more cleanups are about treating symptoms, but preventing pollution really does require um, a lot stronger evidence base. And you can see here that monitoring and analysis, analysis really does fit in the center here. It's guided by that data and it allows all those other aspects to come together to, um, uh, in terms of education, engagement and awareness, source reduction plans and policy projects and programs in order to actually get us to that point where we can have a, have a healthier environment. And I hope that sums up monitoring and, and, uh, and I think now we might have some uh, time for some questions. Let me check the chat. Um, Cecilia, will we, will we be able to have a copy of the slides? Absolutely. Um, the, uh, this, this session will be, uh, has been recorded and we put on, on the Tangaroa Blue website along with the document. And I believe we should also be able to put the slides up there as well, but um, I'll probably need to seek guidance in, internally about how that's all going to work. Um, my provisional answer is yes. Um, thank you, Emily has confirmed that slides are available, wonderful. Um, what I might just do then is if there are any other questions, please do pop them in the chat. I hope you have the ability to unmute if you would like to say something, that would be absolutely perfect. I'll just give you a moment and see what else comes through that chat. Brilliant. Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming along. Hope you can stay with us for the second session, which starts which starts at uh, four thirty. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, and uh, on that note, I will see you shortly. Thank you. Hello and welcome back everyone to part two of the Australian Marine Debris Initiative database protocols to monitor and collect litter and marine debris along different litter pathways. Um, this is part two, as I mentioned, um, the uh, protocols have been developed to offer a standardized approach for citizen scientists collecting this important data on a national scale. Robust monitoring programs led by citizen scientists are vital in guiding marine debris reduction and prevention strategies and to protect the future of our marine resources. Um, this uh, presentation, this video recording and the slides and the link to the protocol uh, will, uh, to the protocol document will be put up on the Tangaroa Blue website in the coming days. 
If this is the first time you're joining us this afternoon, uh, my name is Mark Fletcher. I'm based up at Agnes Water in Queensland. Uh, I've been in the uh, MD database support role since March. Um, on this call, I also have Jody Jones, who's an expert in the field, and she'll be available to answer uh, any more detailed questions that you have. And she'll also be looking at the chat. So I might ask that as we go along, if you've got any questions, please do pop them into the chat. I'll try and keep an eye on that. Uh, as well uh, as Jody, um, and then at the end of the presentation, uh, if you so, sh if you should feel like it, we can perhaps get your uh, your uh, voice in and um, ask any questions that way. Okay, part two: How are the monitoring protocols applied to different types of location settings? We have a bit of an agenda here of six points. The first point is simply to um, just talk in more detail about the site types that we saw in the first part. Uh, and we'll talk then about site inspection and site preparation. This is all with a view to um, getting you to the point where you can start um, undertaking that regular, regular monitoring if, if that's what you choose to do. There'll be a methodology overview of the monitoring, uh, and then we'll look at that for how it may apply to each of the site types, which of which there are six. And then we'll just be wrapping up with a bit of a case study um, uh, of the reef clean project. And you can see um, one of the flags in the picture on the right there. These are the site types that we're looking at this afternoon. Uh, we have on the ground built drainage, inland waterways, estuaries, coastal shorelines and underwater. And just a reminder that the um, MD database um, and the MD um, uh, generally is really about looking at more than just uh, marine debris. It's looking at terrestrial litter as well. And so you can see that terrestrial litter um, probably features foremost uh, for the first two site types there. And then as we move through the, um, the environment, we can see that litter move through into the inland, inland waterways, the estuaries down to the coastal shoreline. When we're looking at site inspections, um, we did mention briefly in the previous session about a monitoring schedule and that we said that it was important to look at monitoring at least every three months. So regularity is key. Uh, and for some site types, that monitoring will be even more frequent. So that's something to be aware of when you're selecting a site is that that is able to be done with that regularity. Looking at the specifics of a site, uh, approvals is very important, um, particularly, for example, with traditional owners, uh, councils, um, other organisations and bodies who have an interest in that site. Um, and it's important that you record some of the site characteristics. So, for example, uh, facilities, um, the potential for landscape transformations over time, uh, the extent of visible litter um, and to consider the impact of other programs or uh, community usage of the site um, and that can really impact the dates and the timings for doing your monitoring. Um, also there needs to be a risk, a risk assessment undertaken um, as part of your site uh, inspection. Um, it's a good this is also a really great opportunity to think about uh, monitoring time, effort and resources required. So for example, you might determine that the site is only suitable for uh, uh, undertaking the monitoring cleanup activities and so the collection of debris, but then you might wanna take that debris off site and to then um, categorize it and uh, perhaps input it into the MD database uh, off site. With all these things, um, Tangaroa Blue is, is um, able to help you with those. So please do reach out. Site preparation. So I'm going to be referring a little bit to the monitoring cleanup because as we know, monitoring is more than, uh, it's the methodology involves actually um, conducting the cleanup at well at a, a level of detail that's, um, that's required for that rigor and consistency. But also there's a general area cleanup and you'll hear me talk about these two things in tandem. So there'll be the monitoring cleanup um, and then there'll be a general area cleanup. And it's actually, as part of the site preparation, you actually just do a general area cleanup. And, and if you've been um, uh, doing cleanups as a matter of course, as opposed to monitoring, for example, then you'll be familiar with, with the, the, um, the general method for undertaking a, a cleanup of the general area. This is actually your baseline survey to understand the little loads as it stands uh, without having done any monitoring on it yet. Having said that, it is, of course, part of your monitoring schedule, but 
it's important to get that baseline. And then subsequent clean cleanups, you'll actually be using those monitoring protocols, which we'll be talking about uh, as we move through the rest of the afternoon. Here's an overview of the methodology. You may recall if you were, you were with us in the first session that I mentioned the word uh, transects. Um, and you can see here out of the six different site types, we actually use the transect based methodology across uh, all but one of those um, built drainage. And we'll, we'll see the difference there in a moment. Um, I guess I wanted to put this slide here just to show you that really we're looking at a fairly spatially straightforward approach where for um, the majority of these uh, sites, we're looking at a uh, four transects with a length of 25 meters. Um, and if you look at three, four and five, the length of 25 meters has, has an accompanying width which goes uh, of that transect, which goes from the vegetation to the waterline. Don't worry too much if some of this doesn't make sense. We'll, we'll go through each of these site types and you'll be able to get a visual on, on how, these, how these work. I'll just leave that there for a moment, just for you to absorb that. Whilst you're doing that, I will quickly check, check the chat. Fantastic. All right, let's move ahead. So um, what we have here is the notion of monitoring cleanup and then a general area cleanup. And typically what will happen is that you'll, as a matter of course, as a matter of your regular monitoring activities, um, you will at the designated time, according to your monitoring schedule, um, you will go down and perform monitoring cleanup. And then once that's done, you'll just do a general cleanup of the area. Um, and that's generally how, how we recommend that things go. Um, in terms of the monitoring cleanup itself, um, it really is a very um, similar process to a general cleanup in the sense that you're standing or, or kneeling uh, within these transects, um, which we will be able to see visually in a moment. Um, and then it's just about extracting the visible litter from leaves or sand or the soft ground. And it's about removing all debris that's greater than uh, five millimeters. What's really important with monitoring and that you do not see in the general area cleanup is that in monitoring, you're actually ensuring that the litter from each of your transects, so four transects typically, will go into its own bag. So we typically use snap lock bags for these. So you can see the pictures on the right. There's some litter collected from transect one, and then there's litter collected from transect two. Um, it's really important to note that um, no litter, so that, that is zero litter, is still data, and we really do encourage you um, to record that. Let's go through the monitoring for each of the six site types. Uh, firstly is on the ground. Um, this is potentially the um, only site type that has a slight, slightly more complexity than the others, but I think I'll hope you'll agree with me by the end that is actually quite straightforward um, when you sort of see it spelled out, which is hopefully what happens next. Um, on the ground, when we're talking about what this uh, sites of this nature look like, it's really anywhere that litter can be found before uh, it enters the aquatic environment. So before it enters um, or on the, on the transition zone into entering to drains or, or into inland waterways. So typically parks is a, is a really good example of this. And this picture on the right is um, of Memorial Park in um, Gladstone. So we're looking at uh, areas near waterways, um, any green spaces, uh, oval sports fields, uh, and also infrastructure adjacent areas. Um, uh, you know, you may well find that near um, certain infrastructure that there's a, a predominance of litter and you'd like to find out more about that. And so maybe monitoring is, a, is an appropriate tool to use there. Um, Areas near built drainage are also included um, in this site type. Um, school grounds, having access to that outside of our hours is important around amenities, um, shopping centers and car parks. We're just gonna be using this Memorial Park example for the next few slides, just to sh show you how it works. So what we do is we divide uh, the, uh, the area, this park, into land use types. Um, and there are three of them. Uh, a transition zone, in this case, it's, it's a car park. Um, and then there's an amenity area with uh, facilities such as um, barbecues and um, actually the skate, the skate bowl there is, is there as well. Um, and the third land use type that we divide this, this park into is what's called the representation area. This is the sporting field, this is the area where uh, it's just the open area. 
So um, one thing to note here is I've mentioned in the notes that X is the entrance to the amenity area. That's just come up. Um, and so that's that that transition zone is where people move from the car park into the amenity area. And so we've, we've included that um, in, the, in the transition zone there. Um, one thing to just sort of put this in context, one of the things your monitoring might seek to achieve is to get some insight and idea uh, evidence-based, of course, around um, where there are some areas where there's a lot of uh, litter and you've identified the types of that litter, and then there becomes an evidence-based argument for perhaps um, uh, putting more bins uh, in, in, in key areas like that. Um, so just to give you an example of other litter types that we may, may see differences in between these three areas here is in the transition zone, you might see cigarette butts. In the amenity area, you might see spoons and straws, and in the representation area, you might see balloons and, and glitter. It's important with on the ground, as we talked about earlier, there may be uh, events on that you need to be aware of so that you can schedule your monitoring at the right times and, um, and not end up biasing your data from, um, from, from a timing that is not suitable to your aims. Okay. I've drawn here and I'm calling an imaginary path. It's, it's in orange, but essentially what it's saying is that this is going to be uh, a, a path through your transition zone uh, wherein you will place your transects. I'm gonna have some, I'm gonna overlay some transects on that for you in a moment so you can see how that works. But just for the moment, just to know that for on the ground monitoring through each of these three uh, land use areas, you need to have kind of paths not concrete, these are imaginary parts, that are 90 metres in length at minimum and have a width of two metres. These curves can curve. So for example, in the amenity area, we, we can see that curving, curving through the facilities there, but they can never double back on themselves. And here is the path that I've just highlighted there for the representation area. I'm going to show you now how the transects uh, are overlaid on those. So I've left the paths there. Green is the first transect. Um, I'm going to use the laser pointer just to say that it's from this point here that a distance has been randomly generated from that start position to transect one. That distance has been randomly generated. What's important to note is that each transect that we define, so you can see here, transects two and three have just appeared. The starting point for each of these transects during your monitoring setup has been defined randomly. So from the start position to here, that distance is random and that, that randomly generated number is the definition of where your transect one will be placed for here and forevermore. Likewise, the distance from the starting point to the beginning of T2 was randomly generated. And that distance, GPS defined distance, is defined once and then forevermore for the rest of your monitoring. And likewise for T3, the distance from here to the start of T3 randomly generated, and then that is fixed uh, in terms of GPS coordinates for the remainder of your monitoring. I hope that makes sense, but we can answer any specific questions on that in a moment. That process that I just described occurs along each of the paths in these three land use zones. And you can see here, we have three transect ones, green, three transect twos, red, and three transect threes in blue. So um, each of them is consistent. So it might be 10 meters or whatever it is, it ends up being that's suitable for the area. It needs to be consistent. If it's 11, it's 11 for all of them. So it's a consistency there. And with a two meter width. So just to reinforce the initial selection of where these transects sit within the path, is random, but then thereafter, it is always the same. Hope that makes sense. Pop any questions in the chat, please, if that's, if that's a little bit unclear. Okay. That was potentially the most complicated one, um, but hopefully uh, it's, it made some sense. And now we'll move on to something a little bit different, which is the built drainage. So this is around site types that cover all parts of the drainage network. So it's from entry um, to outfall. And generally speaking, it's, it's undertaken with an asset like a gross pollutant trap. And 
typically this is um, this can be used in CBD areas, uh, in, the, in the CBD, industrial precincts, shopping centers, public transport terminals, or even in, in recreation areas. It's important to note that one of the things with this type of monitoring and, and these type of assets is that it's really good at being able to sort of capture um, types of litter as close as possible to the source of release. Um, and as we talked about in the first se session, source reduction plans and interventions are, are really a key, um, a key component to, to, to creating a healthier environment by trying to stop things getting um, deposited, litter deposited in the first place. So this is, this is a good uh, type of monitoring to achieve um, those sort of outcomes. One thing that we recommend is that you can be placing traps along different stages of a catchment. So you may recall from the first um, part of this training is that we had a, um, a different, um, uh, different sections of the environment moving through from uh, on the ground right through to underwater. Um, and it might be possible that within um, a CBD, for example, you might be able to place traps at different stages along the catchment as, you, as, as that litter can flow through um, towards uh, the marine environments. So strategic placement there is something of traps is something to think about. Um, due to the amount of litter that can uh, be collected in these traps, uh, monitoring at eight week intervals is, is recommended there. Um, and it's really important to note here that there are partnerships required to achieve this type of monitoring. Um, you know, notably, we've got local government, the owners of the assets, and also infrastructure service providers. So um, there's a few moving parts there, but it's, it's worthwhile. Um, we've had a project um, in, in Victoria and in Melbourne uh, called Let's Strain the Drains. Um, and that's produced some wonderfully sort of detailed data sets for litter um, generated at, at the source in, in metro areas. Um, and you can see here some, um, some happy people sorting the litter um, into these different categories. Um, and this is a bit more of a sort of close up shot of those. And you can just see um, that we're not using uh, on the ground transects as we talked about in on the ground, on the on the ground site type, but instead we're looking at um, categorizing the, the litter on this basis that you see here. Um, that's a good example or a good time to sort of show you um, uh, an indicative schedule. Um, and so this is, this is just um, a schedule from the Let's Strain the Drains um, project. Um, and as I said, we're looking at around eight week um, uh, cycles for this. So that over a year, you get about six, six cycles in entirety. Um, and you can just see some of the steps um, in there. I'll leave that with you for a moment while I just double check the chat, Let's see if we're all good. Fantastic. All right, moving forward. Inland waterways. Um, this is around the covering the foreshores and banks of the, of the freshwater waterways. Um, so we're not including the water itself. Um, and it's important to note here that, that um, tidal marine tidal areas are not included in this. So estuaries and any tidal wetlands are, are not included in the inland waterways site type. We are, for this site type, talking about catchment channels, creeks, uh, rivers, and lakes. And one thing to, to be aware of here is that um, these sort of site types can actually have substantial little loads. And um, one of the reasons you may wish to monitor here might be to um, understand the sort of impacts that may be happening on um, endangered turtles, uh, platypuses. Um, something else to note here when you're looking at site selection is that there are potential issues for erosion and flooding. So uh, to be aware that if you pick a site, you don't want to be in a situation where you're losing that site down the track. Just looking a little bit deeper inland waterways now, um, you'll see here in the picture on the right at Cooks River, um, that there's that kind of imaginary path I mentioned earlier, which is uh, here, it's sort of more of a yellow color. And you can see the four transects that have been placed along that. And as you recall from, from earlier, the initial positioning of these transects was uh, random, randomly generated, um, but thereafter the positions of them are fixed for the, for the uh, remainder of the monitoring project that you're, that you're considering to undertake. 
Um, for this particular site type of inland waterways, you want to be having a site that's got a maximum of a one kilometre shoreline length. Um, I believe this one here, this, this, this yellow line was, was um, 400 metres. And the idea here is that you need a, a sufficient length to be able to put down those four transects that we talked about um, earlier, 25 metres length per transect, um, and they need to be placed within a 200 metre section of shoreline. You'll be noticing that we're moving through a pattern here of uh, required lengths of that path and then the transect. So as we move through here, you'll see that there's a very clear, consistent methodology um, that, that has been taken. So when we look at um, coastal waterways influenced by tides, um, you know, this is, this is in scope for estuary monitoring. We are talking tidal wetlands. We are talking foreshores and banks of estuaries um, like the Burnett River. Um, uh, up at, here in Queensland. Um, the timing is important with these sites just because it's tidal. Um, so you really need to do it uh, within around three hours of low tide um, to allow the best opportunity to access and collect litter. So when you're looking at resources, say volunteers or um, other logistical requirements for monitoring these sites on an ongoing basis, um, the timing is, is quite important. Similarly, uh, we need um, a, you should just be able to see that yellow path that's being traced. Let me see if I can do it for you. It's being traced from around here and moving across to around there. And it's within that extent that uh, four transects, as you can see marked, were randomly placed. So that, that yellow path there is, is, is 400 meters. Um, the width of each of them is between the um, vegetation. We'll look at this in more detail. I realize the picture is quite small, but I've got a case study to show you a bit better. Um, is from the vegetation to what should be the high water line here. And that is true for each of the four transects. Coastal shoreline. Um, on this, we're really looking about anything that's not uh, on or in an estuary. So, um, so, so we're looking at some uh, site type uh, that faces the ocean or is immediately uh, adjacent to the ocean. Um, so those are the requirements for coastal shore, shoreline facing the ocean or immediately adjacent to the ocean. So you're looking at sandy beaches, you're looking at uh, rocky shores or other beach types, including pebble, uh, pebbles or mud. Um, once again, Timing is important and you'd need to do the monitoring within three hours of, of low tide. Um, and the path that we were looking at here, it just moves along in this direction up to there. I believe that was a 400 meter extent at uh, Fingal Bay. So for coastal shorelines, you need to choose a site with 250 meters length of minimum. As I said, we had 400 for this. Uh, once again, um, there's that familiar theme of four trans transects um, and uh, the initial random placement of those transects within a 250 metre section of, of shoreline. Um, again, 25 metres uh, per transect. So the width is just from the vegetation line to the high water line on that one. Might just quickly check the chat. Okay, no problems. Moving on to the last uh, site type, this is um, underwater. And uh, this is something to note that um, really it's, it's looking at any marine waters that are beyond a sort of coastal zone, um, looking at seabed habitats or reef types. Um, and there is monitoring for each of those uh, needs to be separate. So you're either monitoring a seabed or a reef type. So you're not doing all of those in one. It is ensuring that rigor um, by separating those two out. Um, great. And one thing to note here as well is that um, it's important that really the sampling is only done by trained and certified personnel. So we're looking at scuba uh, and uh, free diving. And, and I just note that uh, Pablo mentioned my department. So um, that's excellent. Um, the picture on the right here is courtesy of Reef Check Australia. They, in their monitoring recently, this month actually, they found uh, a broom and they reliably informed us that brooms don't work underwater. So good to know. 
Now, when we're looking at the transects for uh, underwater monitoring, um, there's a few, there's a few ways to do this. Um, the two pictures on the left-hand side are either parallel to shore or uh, parallel to a break wall. Um, and uh, there are reasons why these would be done, but we can talk more about that um, offline if you like. But there is the notion of firstly transects um, with a certain width and length and that they are a certain distance uh, apart. Um, just looking um, at the uh, two right-hand pictures, um, the yellow square is, um, is den denotes a boat and that the transects here actually kind of, well, top right, transects radiate out uh, in a 90 degree pattern. Uh, and where you've got a smaller or fragmented habitat, uh, bottom right-hand picture, um, then the transects um, do not need to radiate out in that, in that cross pattern. Um, but these, this is quite specialised monitoring. So as I said, um, do reach out and, um, and we can work with you and help with you if, if this is something you'd like to be doing. Okay, I'll just quickly check the chat before we move on to the case study. Um, now this is uh, for reef clean. So um, that covers coastal shoreline and estuary monitoring, but I'm just gonna show you some graphics that just cover the coastal shoreline component. Um, so let's move ahead and, and do that. So Reef Clean is a five-year program uh, funded by the Commonwealth up until 2023. Um, consortium of eight organisations covers 33 estuarine and coastal uh, monitoring sites right through from uh, Bundaberg in the south all the way up to um, the Torres Strait in the north. Um, the pattern is very similar to what you've been seeing. So it's the four transects and it's that once you've done those uh, monitoring the four transects, when, um, according to the monitoring schedule, you'll then just hopefully just sort of back that up with a general cleanup area. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. The schedule for um, reef clean monitoring um, is every three months, March, uh, March, June, September and December. And just to make sure, you know, it's clear what the objective is, here, um, it really is focused on reducing the volume of marine debris generated uh, or in or entering the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, a key part of this is increasing awareness in catchment communities about marine debris uh, and actions that they can take. Some practical tips here um, that I will share with you. So there's that timing aspect and you want to be doing uh, on the day of doing the monitoring, you want to be planning to do that for that's within sort of two to three hours of low tide. Um, again, depends on the site. So two, might, two hours might be sufficient. Um, and we do recommend about four to eight volunteers to assist with the field work. Field work. So if you recall that there are four transects uh, and so it's either one person per transect or it can be like a buddy system where you have two volunteers for each of those transects. So based the number of volunteers on the number of transects and the, and the volume of work you expect to be doing and the volume of litter that your baseline survey is indicated may be present. You can input your data well in the field or you can do it offsite afterwards. So you would have already worked out uh, what your approach is um, for this and what you're most comfortable with. In terms of the actual field work, do plan for about two hours and then potentially up to two hours afterwards to sort the debris categorize and input the data. So just to reinforce, monitoring is around building that evidence base with consistency and regularity and really good quality data. So um, in many ways, you know, it's, it's, it's about the, the data afterwards that really is almost more important than actually picking up the litter, although clearly we'd love you to pick up the litter. Um, some sites are more complex uh, and do require more time. So you're potentially looking at four hours of field work. It's advisable before the volunteers arrive, possibly half an hour before is, is, to, is to do some of the setup. And you, I've got some graphics in a moment, which um, just shows you what that setup looks like. Um, and of course, it's super important to, remain, uh, to arrange a, a meeting point um, for the volunteers. Here is a picture of the, um, some of the materials and equipment that we required the other week. Uh, at my local surf beach. Um, and um, you can see here that let's start from, um, let's start from right to, let's go clockwise from top right. So we've got four transects and we're gonna be marking the center point of those transects. And we found cones are very useful 
for doing that. And these are these are the GPS marks where your um, your transects lie um, for every occasion, for every monitoring that you do for that project. That center point mark is really important. Um, we've also got some uh, tag Ziploc bags. Um, and as I mentioned before, there'll be one Ziploc bag, uh, one or more Ziploc bags for each transect. The idea here is simply that you really need to be ensuring that the data, sorry, the litter you collect from each transect uh, is, is absolutely associated with only that transect. You, you need to be able to identify it on that basis as opposed to just putting everything into one bag. Um, also shown in the picture is a clipboard with an MD monitoring data sheet. Um, so when we carry this out, we just chose to do, to do a hard copy um, uh, uh, data. Uh, and then to the bottom left, this is a really useful tool that one of my colleagues, um, Ian, has come up with. Um, quite ingenious. It's just a, a, a garden hose reel that he found at a garage sale and he put some rope on it and he put rope ropes that uh, are a particular length and you'll see in a moment why he's done this and this rope allows him to, to kind of roll out the entire length of rope and the rope has colored sections and the colored sections indicate where the transects go so obviously this is something he's worked out beforehand um, and he's got a regular um, uh, obviously there's regular positionings for where these transects go and the rope just helps him very easily work out where those transects need to be but you'll see that in a moment illustrated a bit more graphically there's a general cleanup area at the end uh, of doing the four transects uh, and these white bags here are simply to collect the, the debris from the general cleanup area. Something that is we find very useful uh, is just to put some flags up to mark um, to mark the transect boundaries. So um, that's something, and that's also a bit of branding for you as well. So that's something to think about. A little bit of an animation to show you how this works. Um, you can see here the vegetation at the top and there's a high tide mark. And what we do is uh, um, we will we'll take that garden hose reel. And again, this is just by way of example, you, you can absolutely use methods that work best for you. And then he rolls out, this is Ian, he rolls out the, the rope. Um, and the good thing to know is that this rope is actually itself was, was marine debris once upon a time. Uh, and these colored rope sections you can see here are either marked in a gray, 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 or red, 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 and red. And what happens is, is that the gray sections mark out where these transects are. Uh, we have, uh, you can see the dimensions here, 25 meters, as we've talked about before, um, and transects T1 through T4. As mentioned, the positioning of these transects was randomly generated at the project start. Um, once those were known, Ian could put his rope together with the right lengths, and then this whole process becomes very easy to repeat. These yellow marks here just represent either tent poles or sticks. And the reason that we, I show them here is that by placing them on the edges of the transect, um, that it simply helps volunteers to know where the transect boundary um, uh, starts and ends. And to make sure that when they're collecting debris within the transect is so that they don't accidentally go out of the transect, for example, and start collecting debris from here, which they then attribute to this transect. That would be incorrect. So these markers are important to show where those boundaries are. Uh, you may well have noticed that we've run out this rope along the kind of middle of the high tide mark. Um, and that means that for each transect, the extent of it runs from the vegetation uh, down to the water line. So the middle of the transect sits over the high tide mark. As, said, as I said, we, we actually tend to pop out some of these flags. Um, we'll just put them either side of the center line uh, just so that it, we volunteers can be oriented um, a little bit better. You recall the cones that I mentioned? We'll pop a, po uh, pop a cone in the middle of each of these transects. So really you're looking at about 12 and a half meters on either side. And these are the GPS marks. So we'll just pop a cone in the middle there um, and that marks the middle of the transect. Um, what we do then is obviously we uh, then go through and collect the litter uh, in each of the transects, pop them into the, uh, the bag that's appropriate for that transect. Um, and I might just show you what happens afterwards on this one, is once we've collected that, we then are able to 
perform uh, a general cleanup and I've marked that in red. Um, the guidance here is that the general cleanup area is simply everywhere that's not in a transect. And this is simply limited by the amount of time that you and the volunteers have available to you. Um, we do recommend that you um, take a GPS mark of uh, the extent of the cleanup area. Um, one GPS mark was taken here and another was taken here. And in this example, we'll just tend to make sure the distance between those two points is just around 500 meters. We find that that kind of works out within the entire two hours. We can do the, um, the monitoring of the transects and the cleanup area all within that two hour window. Here's a visual picture of, well, literally a photograph of what we did. Uh, and you can see the cones in the middle of each transect. Uh, it's, these lines are white, but you get the idea. Uh, and there's the three, uh, sorry, there's the four transects there with the cones in the middle of each of those transects. And here's, um, here's that, that wonderful garden hose tool um, to help us, to help us uh, achieve all of this. Final slide here is just to um, just to sort of clearly show uh, a little bit more detail around the methods that I talked about. And right here, we're looking at uh, the middle of transect three. So um, what Ian has actually done as, as a really a neat idea is simply to tie a ribbon around the middle of, of, um, uh, of the rope where the middle of that transect is. So that's the GPS mark, it's fixed there. So he always knows where, where to place the cone. Um, and as you can see um, in right up at the back here, that this rope runs all the way back to transect two. And you can see very small, but the transect two cone is at the back there. We found it helps that you just pop that little uh, Ziploc bag with the little label to say what transects uh, litter should go into it. We just pop that under the cone. So it's super easy for volunteers to then, um, you know, have a very clear way of saying that litter from this transect must go into that bag there. Hope that gives some practical insight into how to run a run a, a, a monitoring uh, on the ground, um, and that is actually the end of the presentation. So this is absolutely a point where um, we encourage any questions that may come through the chat, or if you want to pop yourself on speaker, that is fine as well. Just give some moments to see what comes through in the chat. Good question from Claudia there. What do we do after we collect the data? So when you've collected the debris, um, we, as I said, you can either then sort of categorize that on site or you can take that off site. Um, and um, our recommendation is that you use the AMD database as a, play, as a place to actually record that data. So uh, whether on site or off site, there's just a process to, for example, roll out uh, a tarpaulin or if you've got some tables or whatever space you've got. And just to kind of um, ensure that you uh, distribute that data along, um, uh, along that surface, making sure that you keep um, T1 data uh, alongside T1, T2 data alongside T2, just to make sure it's obviously kept separate. Uh, and then you go through a process of categorizing that data, for example, into plastic, um, into um, foam, any, anything else, any of the, any of the major categories that we, that we, we can help you um, look at in the AMD database. Um, and then there's a process of transferring that data either into a hard copy uh, materials form, or you can punch that straight into the AMD app and that will get uploaded to the AMD database. So it's definitely a, a sorting, categorizing and then a data entry process. So there's really three steps there. I hope that answers your, your question, Claudia, but please um, please chime in if I've missed, missed something that you'd like to know more about. Hey, um, hi, it's um, Claudia. Just to expand on that, um, we do have downloadable data sheets from our website, um, but uh, we do find that with some projects and for monitoring that it's necessary to tweak some of these data sheets. Um, and we do do training for data collection and data entry in a separate, uh, in, in a separate presentation. Brilliant, thank you, Jody. Hope that helps, Claudia. Brilliant, excellent. If there are any other questions, please do feel free to, to chime in and uh, let us know what your thoughts are. And 
whether this is something that you um, consider could be useful for some sites that you have in mind, or you may just want to share some goals around uh, uh, and get and get perhaps some feedback from Jody or myself around uh, whether there's uh, some a site that you're thinking of that might be suitable for monitoring. So please feel free to to um, put those ideas forward if you like. But otherwise, we'll keep looking at the chat and we'll see what comes through. Just to reiterate, while we're waiting for any more questions, you're welcome, Natasha. Um, we will um, ensure that this video recording is put onto YouTube. A link is then put onto the uh, Tangaroa Blue website, uh, along with a copy of the slides, and of course, um, along with a link to the um, monitoring document, monitoring protocols document um, uh, itself. Um, Michael's question there regarding any suggestions to speeding up data entry. Um, we are working on that at the moment. So we um, are redeveloping the user interface for AMD. Um, so we'll make that a lot quicker. Um, and it's capturing the data, whether or not you try to use a, sometimes it's more practical to do it with a paper-based form, depending on where you're, where you're sitting in the day. Um, I was recently over on Fraser Island um, and using the app in the, in on my phone just was not working because I it was blowing and raining and so it, we end up transcribing onto onto paper but um yeah it's yeah um so yeah and doing some training around data entry as well um doing that part of our training um platform is will help you with speeding up data entry because it'll give you a bit of an a more in-depth understanding of how we'd actually categorize um the data into into the database so we do have that available. Mm, absolutely. Jody, we've got a great question from Cecilia there around um, cleaning an estuary of Moreton Bay, uh, questions around obtaining permission from council and marine fisheries. Um, it's always a really good idea to engage anyone that you can identify in your stakeholder group. So identifying your stakeholders um, in the preliminary set up to your, um, up to your, um, is, is really important. So you want to identify your traditional owner groups um, and you'll want to, um, it's the paper, yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, the um, if you want to, um, yeah, so it's always a good idea to engage those stakeholders. They may have caveats and conditions that you need to work within, um, but it's also um, good to understand like that they might have proposed um, activities for those spaces as well. So you can avoid getting, um, having, walking out to a site and we've done that even within the Reef Clean project. Um, they've put a building there on one of the beaches, they've done a massive development. So we've had to move. Um, so those sorts of things like, um, yeah, so uh, it's, yeah, always make yourself a good list of stakeholders that you want to engage because they can help you with, um, and they're always, and the fisheries and the DES guys are always really interested in any of these sorts of, op, any of these sorts of what, um, activities and will help out when they can as well. Absolutely. And and I think, you know, they, they can they can really play a supportive role that, mm. that um, beyond which any of us could have imagined. And I think that's always good. And people are always very supportive of this. So, um, yes, it's possibly about permissions, but also it's, it's it can be more than that. Um, that'd be quite exciting where that goes. Do, do let us know how that how that turns out, Cecilia. And in some places that there could also be, um, and we work within turtle nesting spaces here in the in in Queensland in northern Queensland, and um, in some spaces, like we've got one island that we just can't we can't go to during certain seasons. So, um, talking with those stakeholders, they may have exclusion times when you can access the spaces as well. So, talking to them, talking talking that through, you might just have to moderate your 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 schedule um, to accommodate for different things. But yeah, it's always good to have that all in your initial plan, so it's not sort of surprising you have in six months in. Absolutely. Just a question there, Jody, from Michael about the paper form reflecting the categories in the database. That's all vetted, yes. Yep, so the um, the categories in the database. So if you use the app um, uh, currently, um, you'll find that it, there's, um, it's pretty, it's a much more intuitive way of um, finding and locating data within the database. But yes, the paper forms, um, the database in the new development will be 
easier to um, navigate into the um, into the paper um, from the paper forms if you're using those. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you, Sean, as well, for uh, offering to help out there with Cecilia. That's wonderful. Any more questions coming through the chat? Well, please feel free to um, turn your speaker on if you, your microphone on if you like. But otherwise, I might just give it a few more minutes, to see, or if that, to see what comes through. If, uh, if anyone's interested in um, a little bit more detail on the Memorial Park in Gladstone, uh, I don't know if I can convince Jody to share a small story about some of the outcomes from that. If you, if you feel <laughs> um, <laughs> so as a part of the development of a lot of these protocols I was a bit of a crash test I, I did test my own method methodologies a little bit um, and didn't entirely look weird walking around parks and parklands with tape measures much um, but um, yeah and it was really interesting like because we uh, to try and scientifically work out like how to monitor spaces that have got lots of different purposes and lots of different ways people use things, use the spaces uh, without buying, biasing the data towards one user group or one item type um, is, is a little bit tricky. Um, so yeah, so we had to, yeah, so that's why with the on ground, we ended up with the three types of areas within those because um, in those car park transition zones, it's like a blast radius for cigarette butts for most of these spaces because people are getting in and out of their vehicles. Um, in and around, like in that particular one with the amenity area being the skate, but skate bowl, we were finding a lots and lots of um, very small pieces of uh, straws and things like that that were basically run over by by a um by a, the maintenance crews in their mowers and then out in the um out in the open spaces we found lots of glitter and things like that so um and small bike small pieces of bikes and skate skating items so that's obviously yeah um so there was yeah there was even within small spaces like that there was just there was differentiations in the data points that were quite were quite noticeable when we broke them down. Mm, brilliant. So those of you on the call, it's definitely something to think about um, uh, uh, sort of kind of moving from just the cleanups, which is obviously fantastic towards that, towards the rigor provided by monitoring and, and to see where that goes in terms of interventions and, and mm. sort of plans. So yeah, if you've got any person, if you've got any, um, uh, personal experiences with this in your journeys uh, after this presentation you'd like to share those with us at a future time please do we'd love to hear um, yeah how you got on. yeah um there was just a thing in here on crab pots as well um mm -hmm. living in central queensland well, i'm very familiar with um crab pots there's uh there are limitations on what you can do with crab pots and um, they're defined by fisheries but there are a lot of associated items connected with um, the crab pot data set. So there's like the little, the, even down to the poly pipes that have got two distinct holes in them that hold these, hold the, hold the collapsible ones up. We find hundreds of them and people don't realise that they're not just a part of a crab, uh, that they're not, that not just a poly pipe, they're actually a part of the assembly of these, of these collapsible crab pots. Um, so recording those cor correctly is, um, is, is also, um, is something that, within a monitoring program, it gives you that opportunity to actually really question each and every article that you're looking at and, and define it in a way that um, gives you meaningful data to take to authorities or that to, and, or to the, or to a stakeholder group to create change. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. All righty. Good suggestion from Michael there. Uh, yes, we do have a paper form um, available on some sort of print. It's a piece of, it's, um, um, it's a simplified version, but it's only a two sheet A4 one um, that's um, on a, like a laminated slate not a slate I'm trying to think of it it's very late in the afternoon um but it's yeah it's on on rewritable you can you can wipe it off and rewrite over the top and 
off it. Yeah. So, uh, Michael, if you need one of those, let us send us an email and we'll get one sent down to you. Oh, the good the good news is Michael's local to uh, Tagnus, so. Um, All right. We, yes, he is too. Open. I do know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we can. Yeah, and basically with yeah, and with those you can reuse those over and over again. So, yeah. So, Perfect. yeah, we really do have good. we do have a tablet type form. No, it's not a laminated one. No, it's not laminated. It's a um, it's actually a, a card. It's actually a, a slate card slate looking thing. Yeah, right. That's it. It's a manufactured yeah. thing, and it's even got like a little um attached to it is a little um, a little pen that you can write underwater with and everything. Yeah, right. Perfect. Perfect. I've got one here, but. It's um, under a pile of stuff. <laughs> Not easy to locate right now. Actually, no, it's in a box that I'm taking with me to World Science Festival tomorrow. Yeah, right. Pablo, just um, maybe if you're just able to, to email me that, we can we can, we can can work out yep. um, next steps on that one. Um, yep. Please feel free to reach out. And look, and just to give those sort of re resources a plug as well, we do have an online identification manual that you can download. Um and we do have um, we do have uh, kits and stuff in our in our um, in our resource kits, and you can have you can view any of those online. Um, yeah, so and yeah, so you can get source those things from uh, our website as well. So absolutely, that's it. Wonderful. Let's just see if there's any few remaining questions to come through before we start moving towards wrapping up. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, appreciate the time. Appreciate uh, listening as well. Um, thank you very much, Cecilia. Appreciate the comment there as well. Um, as I said, uh, if you have any questions, please do reach out. We will have the resources made available on the Tangaroa Blue website in the coming days. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for joining, for listening and have yourselves a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks, Mark.